Okay, folks, uh, my name is Matt Thomas, and I just want to thank you for joining the USGS Landslide Hazards Program Seminar Series. For those of you that are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. Uh, we typically wait until the end of the presentation to take questions, so in the meantime, please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted when you aren't intending to speak. Uh, Rex, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to provide today's introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, today we're going to be hearing from Francis Ashland. Uh, Francis uh, did his uh, graduate study in geology and geological engineering at the Colorado School of Mines under Professor Jerry Higgins. Uh, he joined the Utah Geological Survey, was there for a number of years, uh, and was a, a senior uh, geologist in their geologic hazards um, section. Uh, until he joined the U.S. Geological Survey about 12 years ago. And uh, since joining the USGS, uh, Francis has been uh, stationed in uh, Reston, and uh, he's uh, conducted studies on landslides in uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, Tennessee, and uh, Puerto Rico. And um, so looking forward to uh, hearing about these uh, landslides in Pittsburgh today. And Francis, I just say remember to turn off your video camera and then you're ready to go full screen. All right. Okay. You said turn off the video camera? Yeah, let's just do that for bandwidth issues. OK. Perfect. All right, just let me know when you can see my screen. I can see full screen. Looks good. OK. Well, I want to thank uh, Matt for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, uh, this gives me an opportunity to get out of barn chores this evening, and that's always welcome. Uh, and I want to thank Helen Delano for giving her presentation last week, which uh, provides some valuable background uh, for this case study I'm going to present. Uh, my goal today would be to get you familiar with the events in 2018 in Pittsburgh. Uh, we had an incredibly little wet year. Uh, it began uh, in the winter of 2018 and continued right through the calendar year. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, how those winter storms uh, affected subsurface hydrologic conditions and how those changing hydrologic conditions may have affected the critical rainfall threshold for instability in the region. Um, most of what I'll be presenting today uh, will be focused on the events in Allegheny County and Pittsburgh. And if you look at my little inset map, uh, the gray blob is Allegheny County in southwestern Pennsylvania, and the dark blob in that is the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and the photo on the right, uh, we're looking at uh, one of the first reported landslides in 2018. It was one of the first sites I visited, but it turned out this was actually a landslide that had moved initially in 2017. And like many of the landslides I'll be presenting information on today, uh, we saw some renewed movement uh, in 2018 at this site. Uh, as someone who's never been very fond of heights, uh, what amazes me most about this photograph is those decks. Um, I can't imagine I'd ever have a cup of coffee out there and feel good about it. So I'm going to begin with a chronology of the 2018 wet year. Uh, it really began with two winter storms with heavy precipitation. Uh, heavy in Pittsburgh, in my definition, is a multi-day storm or single day or multi-day storm with about 75 millimeters or more precipitation. Uh, 
in 72 hours or less. Um, and so we had two storms that met that definition. Um, those storms were followed by a series of moderate winter and spring storms. Uh, and as a result of these series of storms, we had widespread landslides in the greater Pittsburgh region, uh, particularly from late February through April. Um, we had uh, additional storms in the summer. They would all be, again, moderate storms that resulted in additional landslides. And then by the time we get out to early September, the remnants of tropical storm Gordon affected the region, resulted in near record daily and storm rainfall, and it induced new landslides in the region. The wet weather pattern continued right through the end of the calendar year, and uh, new landslides were being reported uh, all the way through December. Um, give you some background uh, why this was of specific interest to me. Um, if we look at the two previous wet years, which were 2004 and 1990, uh, scientific reports on the effects of those are really lacking. There's incomplete information on the extent and impacts of landslide movement during those years, and no previous analyses of any data on subsurface hydrologic conditions. And uh, although very limited, uh, we had some of that available uh, in 2018. In general, rainfall-induced landslide movement, although it's been acknowledged in the region, it's never been adequately characterized. Uh, one exception to that is following uh, heavy rainfall associated with Hurricane Agnes in 1972. Uh, there was a landslide inventory in Allegheny County uh, created for that event, as well as a catalog of the heavy rainfall uh, events that have affected the region. So that was uh, really some of the first uh, research on rainfall-induced landslides, particularly those capable or that occurred during these widespread landslide events. Another thing uh, that's relevant to uh, this story is that uh, heavy rainfall rarely corresponds with periods of elevated subsurface hydrologic conditions. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we get into this presentation. I want to begin by showing you uh, what data was available uh, to us in Allegheny County. Um, this is a topography of Allegheny County derived from the 2006 LIDAR. Um, the red blob in the middle is the city of Pittsburgh. And what we're looking at here are the rain gauges and the hydrologic monitoring stations in the county. All the squares are rain gauges. Uh, there's only two of those uh, that provide hour, hourly and real near-time data. And those are the rain gauges at PIA, which is over here. That's the Pittsburgh International Airport and the rain gauge at uh, Allegheny County Airport. Uh, the rest of them, you, we get da daily data. Some of that is eight o'clock in the morning reported um, and often included in National Weather Service storm reports for large events. The other two sites of interest or importance are an observation well, a USGS observation well up in the northwest part of the county. Uh, this well is completed in the Glenshaw Formation, a bedrock formation. It is stratigraphically below the most landslide prone rock units, but contains clay stones, which are regionally referred to as red beds because of their locally because of their color, uh, which are a player in some instability. So that's really the best data we have on deep hydrologic conditions uh, during uh, wet, uh, storm events and wet periods. Uh, the other site is this uh, right here, this triangle, and this is the rock slide. It's the, probably the largest rock slide in Allegheny County. It's in Aleppo Township, and it's been a site of cooperative uh, monitoring uh, between myself and Helen Delano. Uh, since about 2015. And at this location, uh, we do have one soil moisture sensor that's in the shallow colluvium, and that provided us some information about uh, storm response, hydrologic storm response uh, during the events in 2018. 
We also have monitoring of the rock slide both by total station and by cable extension transducers. And so I'll, uh, later in the presentation, I'll present uh, data on the movement of that landslide in 2018. If I recollect correctly, the one thing that Helen really didn't cover was climatic conditions around Pittsburgh. So I'm going to present some data on that for some background. Uh, here we're looking at histograms showing mean monthly precipitation in Pittsburgh. Uh, the dark uh, blocks are based on the entire historical record going back to 1837. The grayer blocks are the normals ending in 2010. Um, we see an annual precipitation using uh, over 926 millimeters a year on average, and our wettest months uh, typically are in June and July or uh, spring, depending on whether, which set of data you're looking at. And the only difference between the recent decades and the historical record of note is that we can see that uh, November is uh, catching up to being one of the wettest months. And that's probably uh, reflecting the fact that November 1985, which is in that record, was the wettest November uh, ever and uh, is affecting that result. If we look at mean monthly precipitation by season, um, like we don't really see a considerable amount of dis uh, difference. There's less than 30 millimeters separating the wet summer from the driest season, which is fall. There's really no difference between winter and fall. Those are our two dry seasons. And, um, and summer is when we have our heaviest rainfall storm and our biggest storms typically. Since this event really began in winter, I want to talk a little bit about snowpack and snowmelt in Pittsburgh. Um, We'll see later in the presentation, we had some contribution uh, from snowmelt and uh, anyone listening to this presentation from the West will probably grimace when I use the word snowpack from the data we're looking at for 2018. Um, Pittsburgh is some, for some reason geographically isolated from uh, heavy snowfall and deep snowpack. Uh, the record snowpack is only 66 centimeters in 1978. Uh, if we think about a snow water equivalent for that, uh, we might be looking at something between 65 and nearly uh, an entire mean winter precipitation, which is respectable for that event. Uh, there are only two other snowpacks that uh, come exceeded 55 centimeters, and and once we get beyond that the number drops off pretty dramatically. Um, we do know that there were landslides associated with the melting of those two deepest snowpacks in 1978 and 1993. So snow melt is capable of inducing uh, landslides in Pittsburgh, uh, but we just don't have dramatic snowpack. And that's one of the reasons uh, I was able to install the shortest snow depth center, sensor I've ever put in uh, and you can see from this photograph uh, the humble snowpack in the early part of the winter at our monitoring site there. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about storms. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a major storm, I would consider any single or multi-day storm that we get 75 millimeters or more in 72 hours or 96 millimeters and four days and and that's your characteristic storm in pittsburgh our record daily and storm rainfall uh, occurred in uh, during hurricane ivan in 1974 uh, in 2004 and we get 151 millimeters so that's the record and that that record is uh, uh, exceeded almost everything that happened prior to that date uh, by a considerable amount. If we want to compare that number to a coastal city in the Northeast. If we look at New York City, we can see daily rainfall is considerably higher and storm rainfall, and this is record storm rainfall in New York City, is almost twice as high as what we would see in Pittsburgh. 
So heavy rain means different things in different locations in the east. Um, the plot on the left shows the uh, seasonal distribution of these storms. They're separated into storms with documented landslides and storms without. Um, and we can see from this that storms with heavy precipitation are relatively rare in winter and spring. We had, uh, since 1926, we've had only five winter storms and six spring storms out of the 59 total that go through 2012. That's when I'm going to uh, end this count. Um, interestingly, for people uh, paying attention to climate change, um, four of those winter storms have occurred since 1990. And two of them bound the 2004 wet year, which was our previous record wet year. So, uh, so most of these winter storms have been relatively recent. The one thing that we can see from this plot is that major winter and spring storms are strongly associated with landslide occurrence. And the other thing that we could look looking at this plot is if we were trying to anticipate what was going to happen in 2018. February is not when we would have anticipated a major storm event. So in this uh, plot, uh, we're looking at the available subsurface hydrologic, uh, or what we know about subsurface hydrologic conditions in Pittsburgh. It's very limited. Uh, we have the observation well in bedrock. That's our information on deep response. And we have a soil moisture sensor and child colluvium up on the rock slide. Uh, at that site, the uh, sensor is about 20 centimeters deep and colluvium, which is roughly 40 centimeters thick, sitting on claystone. So it's representative of a site where you'd have a pretty good permeability contrast at the base of the colluvium. But because it sits in, sits on the head of a rock slide, the slope is flatter than it would be on a site where we where we would anticipate a shallow slope failure. And I would anticipate that the uh, infiltration is more efficient at that site because of the slope than it would be on a moderately sloping site. Um, if we look at the data set and what we're looking at here is the basically the two years of data prior to 2018. Uh, we can see we have a period of elevated soil moisture that begins in late fall and persists through late spring. So that's from B through C. And then um, we have decreasing uh, soil moisture into the summer and early fall. What's really controlling this is that B, uh, that's when we lose all our leaves on the trees. And at this site, we have a large, uh, we have a deciduous forest uh, sitting on the colluvium. Um, and so this is really being driven uh, by evapotranspiration. And see the trees have leafed out and uh, we're starting to get hotter. Um, and you see that the decrease in uh, soil moisture is just interrupted by those heavy uh, summer and fall storms as we get to our seasonal low uh, sometime down in here, which is marked by E. Uh, the lower plot is showing the groundwater depth in meters and the observation well. Uh, this is a composite of all the data available since 1967. Um, so on average, our peak groundwater level is in late April and our annual low or minimum groundwater level is around October 3rd. And the plots on the right show the seasonality uh, in that observation well. So now I want to begin and I, or I want to talk a little bit about those previous wet years. Um, the uh, prior to 2018, 2004 uh, was the most extraordinarily ex ex extraordinary wet year in Pittsburgh's history. We had 11 wet months in the calendar year from January through November. We had, if you go back to September 2003, we had 15 success successive wet months um, during that period. So, I'm sorry. Oh, I think somebody's microphone just accidentally clicked off. It's it's fine now, Francis. Okay. okay. All right. 
and uh, we also had the second wettest September on record. And uh, the wet year was uh, had five major rainstorms. And in the plot on the right, 2004 is the black curve. Um, as I mentioned, we had a winter storm in January and uh, two other storms in May and August. And then a cluster of storms associated with tropical cyclones that track through the region. Um, uh, these are the same storms that impacted North Carolina in 2004, Francis and Ivan. And uh, we can see these uh, late summer, early fall storms are the only two without any documented landslides. Uh, Francis caused a considerable flooding in Pittsburgh, um, but the, not one single news media report of a landslide. And if I could say one thing about the news media in Pittsburgh, uh, they've had over 100 years of landslide experience and they're landslide savvy. So uh, I'm pretty confident if there was a landslide worth reporting, it would have been reported during this event. The one thing I could bring up is that like in North Carolina, it may be, have been difficult to differentiate what was a Francis landslide from an Ivan landslide. Uh, and so I would leave that as an open possibility. Uh, the blue curve shows the 1990 wet year, which was the previous wet year uh, prior to 2004. It had 10 wet months in the calendar year, a record wet December, and we can see a cluster of winter storms. So basically, as I mentioned before, four of our winter storms are happening with these two record wet years. And in 1990, the uh, major storms are happening in the second half of the year. Uh, we have landslides associated with all of them, except for this late December storm. And the reason for that is the precipitation type transition from rain to snow uh, before it ended. And I just want to point out the number of days uh, with measurable precipitation in both those years. Um, so if these were years where umbrellas were needed in both cases. <clears throat> I mentioned, uh, or actually I forgot to mention, but the, uh, the September uh, 17, uh, 2004 storm resulted in widespread landslides in Pittsburgh, the surrounding region, and m much of the Northeast United States. And this is my map of the widespread landslides during Ivan in Allegheny County. So I believe there's about 102 landslides on this map. You can see they were primarily uh, located along the slopes along the river and their tributaries. And Pittsburgh was uh, severely impacted uh, by landsliding during that storm. Although it looks like we have we have less landslides. Well, we do have less landslides in Allegheny County in the west. If you go to counties like Beaver County directly west of Allegheny County, there were a considerable number of landslides in all the surrounding counties as well. Okay, so now I want to talk about conditions prior to the uh, 2018 wet year. Um, 2018 was part of a series of successive wet years which began in 2010. The only exception was 2016, which was near had nearly normal annual precipitation. Uh, the plot on the right is looking at the cumulative departure from the mean annual precipitation, which is plotted in black. And we're also looking here at the peak groundwater level in that observation well uh, at Northwest Allegheny County. And what we can see here is during years that were nearly or just slightly above normal, we did not see an increase in the peak groundwater level from the previous year, but we did see one in those exceptionally wet years. And the exceptionally wet years in this period were 2011, 2015, and 2017. By the time we get to 2015, that groundwater level is approaching the historical high, and we can see our peak level in 2017, right before the 2018 wet year, we're approaching that level again. As I mentioned, we had a very limited uh, 
period of record for that soil moisture probe up on the rock slide. The one thing I can say about that data is that the highest value, uh, soil moisture we've recorded happened in February of March in 2017. <clears throat> so now I want to talk about the precipitation inputs in the 2018 wet year. Uh, what we're looking at here is a plot of daily precipitation and cumulative precipitation uh, for the entire year. I've highlighted the three major storms of 2018 in red and the moderate storms in black. And the asterisks again indicate which ones uh, we have documented landslides for. Um, on the tail end of things, we have the uh, storm associated with Gordon in September. And 2018 is very similar to the previous wet years. We had 10 wet months, including a record wet February and the third wet of September on record. Um, as I mentioned, three major storms, two in the winter, a whole series of moderate storms from late winter to early through through early summer. Um, almost all, all those resulting in multiple or more landslides. And as a result, by June, landslide damages in western Pennsylvania totaled more than $22 million. And that excluded the cost of one specific landslide that impacted the Lincoln Highway. So the real lesson learned, if you've been paying attention to the dates of those September storms, is if you're a wedding planner, you do not want to plan your wedding for September 8th in Pittsburgh. So. <laughs> So here we're looking at uh, the precipitation inputs uh, in the early part of this wet year. Uh, in blue, we're looking at our snow depth of the snowpack. And uh, in black, we're looking at the rainfall component of uh, our daily precipitation. Uh, so the dates, some of these uh, Rainstorm events are going to be different from what you would see in other figures because I'm showing only the portion of storm uh, where we have precipitation type is rain. So in our first winter storm on January, which began on January 11th, we had two days of rain and the precipitation type changed over to snow. And we can see we start accumulating snow, which ultimately would become our peak seasonal snowpack. Uh, you can see that's only about 18 centimeters deep. Uh, Assuming reasonable SWE, we probably have about 60, 60 millimeters at most of water in the snowpack, and that's all melted off by about January 22nd. And we'll look at how that affects shallow soil moisture a little bit later. Um, one of the reasons winter rainstorms are relatively rare is it stays pretty cold in Pittsburgh in winter. Here we're looking at our maximum and minimum air temperatures uh, for the same period. In gray, we're looking at minimum. We can see in that January storm, our minimum air temperatures stayed below freezing for most of it, except during those first two days. And then that's why we're, we're transitioning from rain to snow. The snow melt that was possible was because that minimum air temperature stayed above freezing for a couple of days. And as we see, as we get into those February storms and the end of the winter, uh, we have more time uh, with that minimum air temperature above freezing. And that's why these late February storms are primarily rainfall. When into March, we can see that minimum air temperature drops back down. And in this period of time, we're basically back to a more winter weather pattern, even though we're in meteorological spring. And we can see our spring snowpack uh, gets developed during that period of time. As a result of those precipitation inputs, um, cumulative precipitation uh, for the early part of the calendar year tracked really strong. Uh, here we're looking at that for the five of the wettest peri periods on record, and, and the red curve is 2018. 
after that uh, mid-February storm, uh, we have record cumulative precipitation that persists into early May. Um, if we look at the other years in comparison, 2011 is in recent history, and I know from Bill Adams at PennDOT that that was a year where the uh, PennDOT district in that western Pennsylvania, which includes Allegheny County, was dealing with numerous landslides uh, as a result of that pattern. So we're seeing a very similar pattern to 2011. We're actually exceeding that for this whole period in time. So let's look at the landslides. Uh, we'll begin by looking at the distribution of these winter spring landslides in Allegheny County. Uh, this is a map of 100 landslides uh, for this time period that I documented. Um, and it's color coded where possible, where we have timing information uh, for these storms. So for the big uh, major storm in mid-February, these are in red and you can see uh, a good number of them are clustering within the city limits. Uh, so Pittsburgh itself was highly impacted by that first storm. Uh, the moderate storms that followed, we can see a sort of a broader distribution for that late February moderate storm and even a broader distribution uh, uh, for the spring storms. The white dot, dots are agency reported landslides without timing information. Um, and uh, so we can see their extent and distribution, but can't really relate them to a specific storm. What's not shown on here, and this was reported to me by the PennDOT maintenance folks, is the hundreds if not more of uh, small shallow soil slips that are decimeters in thick and range from a few meters to several hundred meters in area. Uh, it just happened on cut slopes throughout uh, the region. And uh, they basically said these were too numerous to count. So finally, I'll get a look at some of these uh, landslides. Uh, the initial February 14th storm, we have 13 documented landslides, which adversely impacted at least nine roads and 12 homes. Uh, this is a landslide in Pittsburgh that impacted a residential property that was cliffside. So right at the edge here, uh, there's a vertical rock cliff and homes down below as well. So basically this backyard is sliding from right to left. Again, we can see a distressed deck which is a common Pittsburgh feature. And this material is just going over the edge of the cliff and falling and impacting the residential property down below. Probably the most impressive landslide uh, in this initial period uh, was this landslide here at Pittview Avenue in Reserve Township. Uh, this is north of the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, like many of the landslides, this was a, lands, a pre existing slope failure that we saw renewed movement in February of 2018. The road was initially damaged sometime in 2017, uh, but in February, in February, it slid again and quickly mobilized into a debris flow that traveled 415 meters downstream and impacted a very critical highway at the bottom of the slope. So this is just a photograph uh, showing this site in 2017. You can see uh, there's road damage at this time. So just evidence that this was a pre-existing landslide, a good case for progressive slope failure that was aggravated during 2018. And this is another view showing the track of the debris flow. So this is our landslide up here, travels 415 meters. You can still see the debris flow along Highway 28. This is a major transportation corridor for anybody coming in from the Pennsylvania Turnpike or from the northeastern part of the county. Um, I don't recollect if this impacted the travel lane. Certainly looks like it blocked a culvert. And we can see other critical infrastructure on the other side of the highway, including these railroad lines.
the next uh, storm uh, in late February, uh, again, we have 14 documented landslides we can associate with that storm. Uh, this is one of the most spectacular ones in Pittsburgh. This is actually the site of a 2010 landslide that Helen and I both investigated. In 2010, the landslide was movement was happening on the other side of this salmon colored house here. Um, and most of the movement was happening in the background. In 2018, the complex reactivated on its west side and all this in the foreground moved from left to right. And this is a view of the main scarp undermining a corner of the foundation wall for a historical house that used to sit right about here. Just one example of one of the spring landslides. This is in a Penn Hills, a community which is to the northeast of Pittsburgh. Um, many of the residential areas, we have re uh, subdivisions at the base of the slope, subdivision at the crest of the slope, and a forest the slope in between. Uh, we can see we had some pretty dramatic movement in this landslide, and a secondary hazard was associated with falling trees. So the damage to this house and the deck down below was as a result of trees falling off the slide, not impact of the debris into the house. And this was a view of the head of the same landslide, and it was encroaching on the backyard of a residential property up above. So now we'll look at some of the subsurface hydrologic data we had for the winter and spring events. So we begin by looking at the possible contribution of a snowmelt. Uh, this black curve here is showing our volumetric water content in the colluvium at a depth of 20 centimeters at the Aleppo rock slide uh, for this period in time. Um, this is our snow depth data uh, from the same site. At Aleppo, unlike at the airport uh, before we get into that first storm in January. We still had a minor amount of snow on the ground. So when that uh, storm kicks in, we have a little bit of rain on snow. And then again, as I mentioned, uh, the storm precipitation type changes and we start accumulating snowpack. Uh, we can see some peaks in here, which we can associate with some of the snow melt. And by the time we get out to late February, where we're into these February storms, our winter snowpack is completely gone, no longer really contributing. So some contribution from snow melt. I think one of the things we do see in this data set is our, our peak volumetric water content for that storm is higher than what we saw with the rainfall events in February. And I think that's the contribution of that uh, snow melt. This is looking at the uh, shallow uh, hydrologic storm response uh, for those three winter storms. Uh, what we have in gray, our gray curve is gonna be volumetric water content. Where I have a blue curve, that's our snow depth. So we only have that for the January storm. In the black, we're just looking at cumulative precipitation for each storm. And I point out where we have our peak hourly rainfall intensity. Um, for reference, I'm putting in sort of a base level uh, volumetric water content. For most of the plots, this will be the antecedent low preceding each storm. I'm just using, uh, for this first plot, I'm just using this as a reference, but we can see that prior to the January storm, we have one of our, our lowest volumetric water content, uh, and it's starting to pick up as the snow melts off, and then we have our storm event. Um, no landslides associated with this event, except once the uh, snowpack that accumulates melts off a, a few days later. Um, the first major storm of winter in February, um, the one thing we see here is that all of the documented landslides happen after our peak rainfall intensity, after our peak shallow soil moisture, and after we have cumulative rainfall uh, up above 70 millimeters. And uh, 
For most other events, we have timing information that uh, for individual landslides where we can relate it to our soil moisture conditions. Uh, for our last storm in February, what we're seeing here is correspondence of landslides for which we have timing with peak uh, soil moisture conditions um, and whether or not we can transfer this over to the actual locations uh, that these are occurring. I, I think that's a function of debate. One thing I didn't mention about the distribution of rain gauges is because Pittsburgh is a sort of a plateau type country, there's not a lot of variation for these large storms and rainfall. If you look at monthly rainfall in February of 2018, differences between the rain gauges varied by no more than 25%, and that's probably a reasonable number uh, for most of the storms as well. So that may, uh, uh, may be relevant to uh, using data from a single site as a as being representative for anticipating landslide occurrence elsewhere in the county. As I showed you, we did have some uh, snowpack in spring, so we do have some uh, snow melt contribution to some of these peaks. One, th one of the things we're going to see is our minimum volumetric water content and that shallow colluvium is going to step up into spring and then basically stay relatively elevated during this period of documented landslides. Uh, so here we're just look, again looking at our snow depth and our uh, rain component of our precipitation uh, during these daily precipitation events. And here's our uh, specific storm response uh, for these spring storms. Uh, we can see uh, these are moderate storms. Uh, this often some significant gaps in rainfall or periods with light rain separated by more moderate rain. And so we've got uh, sort of a stair-stepping butte sort of pattern to some of the uh, soil moisture response. Uh, again, if we look at where we're seeing occurrences, we can see that these landslides are happening during some of our peak or interim peak uh, periods in our shallow soil moisture uh, throughout these storms. So as I mentioned, our antecedent or pre-storm soil moisture is sort of stepping up. And one of the things I could say for this period between February and April is that as that soil moisture increases, it appears our critical precipitation for slope failure decreases. And uh, so lo looking at that, just for this limited data set, we get a pretty good response that's so pretty easy to draw a straight line to five points, but it's a trend that uh, seems to possibly have existed during this period of time. So with that thought, I went back and looked at the 2005 uh, winter as well, because in this period of time, we had that major January 2005 storm, but we also had a few moderate storms that directly followed and I was able to extract that uh, those storms also had landslides uh, following the major storm in 2005. So collectively, if I put all that data together, we've got the data from our major storms, either gray or black, um, and our moderate storms that followed. And this is mean intensity versus duration. So if you can imagine a critical threshold, it's a lower limit for this data set and lower for this data set, it looks like we maybe have collecting enough data where we could see uh, uh, a soil moisture dependent uh, critical rainfall threshold for this region. Now I'm going to get into what I really enjoy and that's a deep seated landslide activity. Uh, anybody who knows me knows my favorite place to be is someplace like the Thistle landslide. Uh, and so we had a good number of deep seated landslides and I'll just give you a quick overview of those. Um, uh, one of the most problematic that happened I guess, is this uh, earth, an earth flow in Greenleaf Street in Pittsburgh. Um, for reference, we're looking at the uh, football stadium here. Anybody who's a Minnesota Vikings fan 
We prefer the landslide was on the other side of the river, perhaps. Um, we're looking at the slope that fails in 2018 and early 2005, and we can see uh, some disturbance up here. Um, so we've probably had some slope movement either during uh, 2004, which is our previous wet year, or during early 2005, maybe that January 2005 storm at this site. In 2018, this earth flow reactivated globally. Uh, most of the activity happened in late February. Uh, by Sunday, the 25th, it had destroyed a house, destroyed Greenleaf Street, which is a neighborhood road that went diagonally up the bluff. And the debris came down and I believe it blocked a major commuter corridor, Route 51, which may also be the Lincoln Highway in this part of the world, uh, and knocked out power to 4,000 customers in this area. Uh, this resulted in a very costly stabilization and all fell in Pittsburgh City's lap. Uh, this is a view upslope uh, as they removed the debris debris from Greenleaf Street uh, taken in early March. Uh, you can see it's pretty wet. You can see these nice slick and sided surfaces uh, at the base where they've removed the debris. And this is the main scarp. I wasn't going to go walk out here and put anything in the scale. You can see how wet it was. This was very unstable ground when I was out here. Uh, this is about 14 meters vertical local relief and there's some houses up there for generalized scale. You can see how wet it was uh, still in early March. Another earth flow uh, across the river in Kilbuck, which if you ask somebody like Jim Hamill is becoming one of the landslide centers of the greater Pittsburgh region. Uh, also saw its initial movement in late February, almost the same time, February 22nd, but in this case, movement continued right into early March. On, on the left is LIDAR-derived topography and my mapping of what the likely approximate uh, pre-existing earth flow looked like. And the black line here uh, shows the approximate limits of what was active in 2018. This is a view down slope on the left flank, looking at a house that was displaced tens of meters and was later demolished. And most costly and landslide of the season uh, was a slope failure uh, that completely destroyed Route 30, which is the Lincoln Highway in East Pittsburgh. Um, I believe this cost tens of millions of dollars to repair. Uh, Federal Highways came in and funded this work. Um, the initial movement was reported in March, and uh, initially PennDOT was trying to keep this road open. Uh, when we get into early April, they started to see significant increase in the velocity of the landslide directly down slope. It's an apartment complex with some people that have challenges evacuating. So the emergency management officials evacuated those buildings just in the nick of time. On a Sunday morning, the whole thing catastrophically failed and destroyed those apartment complexes, or at least uh, one or two of them. And, um, and fortunately, there was no loss of life, but this is what they were left with after that uh, catastrophic collapse. This is a view of the site after it was stabilized. Uh, this is the apartment complex that was down below or what remains of it. Um, and this is a view prior to 2018 where you can see the buildings that used to be there and evidence that this also was a pre-existing landslide uh, based on the road repair observed in August 2016. So for the landslides I just described and one other earth flow in the northeastern part of the county, um, what I tried to do is relate this to our groundwater level and our bedrock observation well. 
So what this plot is showing is our cumulative departure and precipitation uh, for starting in the beginning of the calendar year. Uh, and you can see the groundwater level reasonably tracks that. Uh, one thing I've recognized from my analysis of historical landslides in the region is uh, for the for those that have occurred while this observation well is in place, uh, it's an increased likelihood of landsliding when that groundwater depth is less than 1.7 meters. So I use that to see what was happening here. And what I'm showing in these labels, uh, EF is for earth flow, uh, DS is deep seated landslide, and that refers to the uh, Lincoln Highway landslide, is I'm showing the movement episodes for these events. The A's are the initial movements, and B are accelerated or increases in velocity. And we can see that uh, these landslides initiate when the groundwater level is higher than one point or shallower than 1.7 meters and accelerates. Uh, in this case, this one's accelerating near that peak groundwater level. Uh, we see Lincoln Highway, same story. For a while in March, we had a, a deeper groundwater level. When it came back up above 1.7 meters, we see those second uh, set of deep seated landslides start to become active. So, starting to get a little optimistic about the usefulness of this. We have one other site, and this is our monitored rock slide in Aleppo. Uh, on the left, this is my map of it. Uh, the rock slide is here. It's in red and this grayish yellow color. I'm just subdividing it based on the rock type. Now, this stuff here is Morgantown sandstone, and this stuff here is displaced claystone and red beds. Um, our weather station uh, sits right in here, and we have uh, two monitoring sites, one up in the head and this well-defined Graben, where we have both total station monitoring, our CET, a tilt meter, and our soil moisture probe. We also do periodic total station monitoring down at the toe. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, this is just a profile of what that total station profile uh, profiling site looks like. Um, got one target on the toe bulge just sitting in the claystone and one on a colluvial wedge which is just getting bulldozed in front of the slide uh, so this is what the data looks like and uh, we've been monitoring at this location since 2013 uh, this is displacement in millimeters uh, really not a lot was happening and then we get out to the, that 2017 wet year which precedes the 2018 wet year and we start to see an increase in uh, the average velocity between these measurements. The critical point I want to point out is this March 5th date. Uh, March 1st is the peak groundwater level in the observation well. We see a dramatic increase in the average velocity following that right through May. If we go down below and I just lost my cursor but oh, there it is. Um, I'm highlighting uh, where the uh, groundwater level in that well is shallower than 1.7 meters and we can see May 20th is when it drops below that depth so in this period of time we're in this extended period of shallow groundwater um, and again this is the groundwater conditions in the stratigraphy directly below the rock slide um, and then once we get to a deeper level we can see that the average velocity drops off when we come back out of it um, in later later part of the year okay we can see an increase in the average velocity once again and this this measurement period extends all through this period at the end of the calendar year i do it okay uh, just a few more slides uh just a brief discussion on those uh summer landslides and shallow moisture conditions um that one uh, plot that I showed you from late winter to spring doesn't really apply uh, to the what we're seeing here in that uh, we're in a whole different evapotranspiration regime as we get in the summer. OK, everything's leafed out now. We're much hotter temperatures. Uh, one thing we can see we're what we're looking at here. Um, this is not daily rainfall. I'm sorry for that. This is our uh, volumetric water content. Um, at the, at the soil moisture probe and the rock slide. Um, what we're looking at, so we're looking at soil moisture and we're looking at 
our moderate summer storms. First thing I want to point out is that all but this one have landslides associated with them. And so we're getting again again while we're getting these elevated soil moisture conditions up to the rock slide, we're seeing landslide movement. Um, one thing we can see in this data is in 2018, which is our wettest year on record now, um, our annual low level staying above the low for the period of record. Now that's only a two year record, but uh, we're wetter than we were in the previous years. And um, this is daily rainfall for the storms uh, uh, up above. One of my thoughts when we look at this, and we did have one verbal report from a landowner at one of these homes, is that when we're getting out in the summer, we want, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of progressive slope failures being aggravated by these storms rather than we're looking at initial movement of landslides in the summer. Um, and Helen can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, we did interview one of the homeowners for one of these homes that was ultimately destroyed at the site. And I believe he said the initial distress was back in the spring. Yeah, um, I think he did. No question. OK. So the last big event of the calendar year is Gordon. All right, so tropical storm Gordon uh, makes landfall on the Gulf Coast, uh, becomes an extra tropical low, sort of follows the Ohio River Valley. Goes up the middle of Ohio, the northeast arm basically impacts the uh, western Pennsylvania. So you can see all these blurbs. And, uh, and ultimately, what we get out of that is another landslide event associated with a tropical cyclone in Pittsburgh. And uh, this is one of the sites I investigated in September. Uh, this is a dam. There's a reservoir up above. I think this is recreational. Uh, this is a residential subdivision that wraps around this thing. This is one of at least two landslides on the dam. Nothing to worry about whatsoever. Well, what we get out of this storm, uh, and here's our soil moisture data uh, for this event, out highlighted in red. Um, this, this gives us our second wettest Storm total rainfall on record, only Ivan dropped more rainfall. That was the 151 millimeters in 2004. So this storm exceeds Francis. It's very similar to Francis in that it was preceded by basically what is going to be the annual low uh, soil moisture conditions and the annual low groundwater level conditions for 2018. Um, we also have the second highest daily rainfall record. So again, this surpasses Francis for that. But as I mentioned, um, very dry and seeded moisture get condition prior to that. Uh, nevertheless, I identified at least seven landslide sites. I wouldn't necessarily say the storm resulted in widespread landslides. Honestly, I haven't really investigated this uh, fully yet. I'm actually looking forward to the 2019 LIDAR that Helen mentioned. Uh, it might be a good way to map some of these landslides. Um, and this is just looking at the specific storm response uh, during the storm. Again, we're looking at uh, 143 millimeters of rain coming in pretty strong in this period of time. And uh, for our period of record over soil and moisture probe, this is the highest value uh, we've recorded at the site. And so with that, I'll open it up for questions.